Hi, I'm Peter Burris, and welcome to another CUBE conversation from our The Cube Studios in Palo Alto, California. In this conversation, we're going to build upon some other recent conversations we've had, which explores this increasingly important relationship between semiconductor memory, or flash, and new classes of applications that are really making life easier and changing the way that human beings interact with each other, both in business as well as in consumer domains. And to explore these crucial issues, we've got two great guests. Brian Kumagai is the Director of Business Development at Toshiba Memory America. Scott Beekman is the Director of Managed Flash at Toshiba Memory America as well. Gentlemen, welcome to theCUBE. Hi, Peter. Thank you, Peter. So, I'm going to give you my perspective. I think this is pretty broadly held generally, is that as a technology gets more broadly adopted, people gain experience with it. And as designers, developers, users gain experience with technology, they start to apply their own creativity and it starts to morph and change and pull and stretch a technology in a lot of different directions. And that leads to increased specialization. Uh, that's happening in the flash world. Have I got that right, Scott? Uh, yes, yeah, the, the great thing about flash is just how ubiquitous it is and how widely it, it's used. And if you think about any electronic device, it, 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 needs, a, it needs a brain, a processor, it needs to remember what it's doing, memory, and, and memory is what, what we do. And so we see it used in you know, so many applications from smartphones, tablets, printers, uh, laptops, uh, you know, um, uh, streaming media devices, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, that, that uh, technology uh, we see used, for example, um, uh, like EMMC memory. It's a low power uh, memory. It was designed for, for like smartphones that aren't plugged in. And, uh, and so when you see smartphones, 1.5 billion smartphones, it drives that technology and then migrates into all kinds of other uh, applications as well. Um, and then we see new technologies that come and replace that, like UFS, Universal Flash Storage. It's intended to be the high performance replacement to EMMC. And so now that's also migrating its way through smartphones and all these other applications. So there's a lot of new applications that are requiring new classes of flash, yeah. but there's still a fair amount of uh, uh, applications that require traditional flash technology. These are not coming in and squashing old flash or mm -hmm. traditional flash or yeah. other types of parts, but amplifying their use in specialized ways. Brian, tell us a little bit about that. So it's interesting that uh, these days no one really talks about the original NAND flash that was ever developed back in 1987. And that was based on a single level cell or SLC technology which today still offers the highest reliability and fastest performing uh, NAND device available on the market today. And because of that, uh, designers have found this type of memory to uh, work well for storing boot code and some levels of operating system code. And these are in a wide variety of devices, both in the consumer and industrial segments, anything from uh, set-top boxes connecting streaming video, you've got your uh, uh, printers, um, you've got uh, AI speakers, uh, just a numerous uh, breadth of products. I got to also yeah. believe a lot of, uh, lot of uh, IOT, a lot of industrial yes. edge devices are going to uh, feature a lot of these kinds of parts. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe disconnected, maybe connected, but need low power, very high speed, mm -hmm. low cost, highly reliable. That's correct. And because these particular devices are still offered in lower densities, it does offer a very cost-effective solution for designers today. Okay, well let's yeah. start with one of the applications that is very, very popular in the press. Mm -hmm. uh, automated driving, or autonomous vehicles. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and look, it's, it's, there's autonomous vehicles, but there's autonomous robots more broadly. Mm -hmm. but let's start with autonomous vehicles. Scott, uh, what types of flash-based technologies are ending up in cars, and why? Okay, so we've seen a lot of uh, changes within vehicles over the last few years. Uh, you know, increasing storage requirements for like infotainment systems, you know, more sophisticated navigations, uh, voice recognition, uh, uh, you know, instrument clusters, more uh, informative digital displays, and then ADAS features, you know, collision avoidance, things like, like, like that. And all that's driving uh, more, more memory storage and faster performance uh, memory. And in particular, what we've seen for automotive is it's basically uh, adopting the type of memory that you, you have in your smartphone. So smartphones have a long time have used this, what I call this EMMC memory, and that has made, made migrated its way into automotive. And now, uh, as, as uh, 
uh, smartphones have transitioned, been transitioning to UFS. In fact, Toshiba was the first to introduce samples of UFS, UFS in early 2013, and then you started to see it in smartphones in 2015. Well, that's now migrating into automotive as well. They need to take advantage of that higher performance, the higher densities, um, and so uh, and so Toshiba's. Yeah, we're supporting uh, you know this this growth within automotive as well. But automotive is a is a is a market, and, and again, I think it's a great mm -hmm. distinction you made. Yeah. It's just not autonomous. It's the even when the human being is still driving, it's mm -hmm. the class of services that are provided to that driver, mm -hmm. both from an entertainment safe and and safety and overall mm -hmm. experience standpoint, mm -hmm. is driving us very aggressively forward. Uh, that volume in and the ability to demonstrate what you can do in a car mm -hmm. is having a significant implications on the other classes of applications that we think for some of these high-end parts. How is the experience that we're incorporating into an automotive application or set of applications mm -hmm. starting to impact how others envision how their consumer products can be made better, better experience, safer, et cetera, uh, in other domains? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it, we see that uh, all kinds of applications are taking advantage of the, this, these technologies, like, like even AR, AR, VR, for example. Again, it's all, it's all taking advantage of this idea of, of needing higher, uh, larger density of storage at a lower cost, uh, with low power, good performance, uh, and all these applications are taking advantage of that. Uh, including automotive, and, and if we look at automotive, uh, you know, it's it's not just within the vehicle. Actually, it's estimated, you know, projected that autonomous vehicles may need like one to three terabytes of storage within the in, within the vehicle. But then all the the data that's collected from cameras and sensors needs to be uploaded to the cloud, and all that needs to be stored. So that's driving storage to data centers because you you basically need to learn from that to improve the software for the you know for uh, uh, you know for the autonomous the vehicle. And yeah, exactly. So all these things are driving uh, more and more storage, both with, within the devices themselves, like a car is like a device, but also in the data centers as well. So if we can, Brian, take us through some of the decisions that a designer has to go through mm -hmm. to start to marry some of these different memory technologies together to create, whether it's an autonomous car, or perhaps something mm -hmm. that's a little bit more mundane, mm -hmm. just might be a computing device. H what does a designer, how does a designer think about how these fit together to serve the needs of the user and the application? Um, I think uh, these days, you know, a lot of new products, they require a lot of features and capabilities, so I think a lot of uh, input or thought is, is going into the, the memory size itself, you know, I think. Uh, software guys are always wanting to have more storage to write more code, that sort of thing. So I think uh, that is one uh, step that they think about, uh, size of the package, and then cost is always a factor as well. So, uh, you know, the thing about Toshiba is we do offer a broad uh, product breadth that uh, produces all types of uh, non-volatile memory that'll uh, fit everyone's needs. So give us some examples yeah. of what that product breadth looks like and how it maps to some of these mm -hmm. application needs. So we, um, like I mentioned, we offer the lower density SLC NAND. Uh, that starts at a one gigabit density. Uh, and then it maxes, about, maxes out of a 32 gigabit die. And then as you get into a uh, more multi-level cell or a triple level cell or uh, QLC type devices, uh, you're being able to use uh, memory that's up to, a single die could be up to 1.33 terabits. So there, there's such a huge range of memory devices available today. And so if we think about where the memory devices are today and where applications are pulling us, what kind of stuff is on the horizon, Scott? Well, uh, it, one is just more and more storage. You know, for for smartphones, we want more. You know, 256 gigabyte, 512 gigabyte, one terabyte, and um, and in particular for a lot of these mobile devices, uh, you know, like I mentioned, UFS is really where, where things are going and continuing to advance that technology, and continuing to increase their performance, continuing to increase the densities, uh, and so. Uh, you know, and that enables a lot of applications that we actually are hard to envision at this point. I mean, we know autonomous vehicles are important. I'm really excited about that because I'm going to need that when I'm 90 and I, you know, can drive <laughs> to where I want to go. But um, and, and then AI, you know, uh, 
where our, where our AI is going. So there's a lot of things though, uh, you know, we have some idea now, but there's things that we can't envision and this technology enables that. And it enables other people uh, who can see, how do I take advantage of that? The, the faster performance, the greater densities, the lower cost per bit. So if we think about uh, generally computing, mm -hmm. uh, especially some of these applications we're talking about where uh, the customer experience is a function of how fast the device starts up, or how fast the service starts up, or how rich the service can be in terms of different classes of input, uh, and, you know, voice or visual or whatever mm -hmm. else it might be. And we think about these data centers where the closed loop between the processing and the inferencing of some of these models and how it affects what that transaction is going to do, we're talking about lower latency, and that's driving a lot of designers to think about how they can start moving uh, certain classes of function closer to the memory. Uh, both from a security mm -hmm. standpoint, mm -hmm. from an error correction standpoint. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about the direction that Toshiba imagines uh, the differentiability of uh, future memories relative, or you know, memories today relative to where they've been. How, what kinds of features and functions are being added to some of these parts to make them that much more robust in some of these applications? Um, I, I think, uh, as you man mentioned, uh, the robustness of the memory itself, and I think that uh, actually some current memory devices will allow you to uh, actually identify the number of bits that are being corrected, and then that kind of gives an indication on the integrity or the reliability of a particular block of memory. And I think as users are able to get early detection of this, they can do things to move the data around and then make their overall uh, storage more reliable. Anything, Scott, you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we continue to, to figure out how, how to cram more bits within a given uh, space. So, you know, moving from SLC to MLC, the TLC, the QLC, uh, that's all enabling that, to uh, enable greater storage, um, uh, lower cost, uh, and then, it, as we just talked from the beginning, just the, there's all kinds of differentiation in terms of, uh, of flash products that are really tailored for certain things. Some are focused for really high performance and you give up some power. And others, you need a certain balance uh, of that where, you know, a mobile device, you, you know, handheld device, you're not going to plug in. You know, you give up some performance uh, for, for less power. And, and so there's a whole s uh, spectrum. Some of, you know, endurance is incredibly important. So we have a full breadth of products to, to address all those particular needs. So the designer, it's just whatever I need, I can come to you guys. Yeah, and that's right. And Toshiba tries to have the full breadth of, of products available. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much for being on theCUBE. Okay. Brian Kumagai, Director of Business Development at Toshiba Memory America. Scott Beekman, uh, Director of Managed Flash at Toshiba Memory America. Again, thanks very much for okay. being on theCUBE. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And this closes this CUBE conversation. I'm Peter Burris. Until next time, thank you very much for watching.